when he was asked to cut funding to the arts during World War II to fund the war effort, Winston Churchill replied, then what are we fighting for? This tale, apocryphal as it may be, highlights the problem that we face today. What are we automating for? We seem to be on this relentless mission to automation. But then what? Why are we automating in the first place? All these efficiency gains, then what? What are we actually going to do with them? What does this allow us to do more of? The more we automate and the more we make automation the goal, the more we will get involved, locked even, in this race to the bottom of efficiency. And it's a race that we will lose against machines. But what's left? What can machines not do? There was a competition between doctors and AI held in China. NeuroMind, artificial intelligence versus the highly trained doctors. And they brought together 15 of the most prominent and well-trained doctors, neurosurgeons from their fields to pit their wits against robots in a competition where they had to analyze scans Scans of brains, neuroimaging scans, and deliver diagnoses. And they were tested for their speed and their accuracy. Doctors versus machines. And they found out that machine, the AI, was twice as fast and 50% more accurate than a doctor. A team of doctors, a team of doctors, each with 20 to 30 years of on the job experience. So what does that mean? Well, it means that the machine is better at automation, because really, if diagnosis is about recognizing patterns and recognizing billions of data sets, there's no way a human being can compete with AI. What's left? Well, This is how we need to use AI. We shouldn't use AI just to automate. We must automate to elevate. Automate to elevate means allow AI to do all the heavy lifting for us, but elevate our communication. So the fact that a doctor can be replaced by a machine doesn't necessarily replace the role that a doctor can perform with a patient. See, what a doctor can do and what any medical professional could do is sit with a patient, hold their hand and say, how are you? That is the difference between machine and human being. And as it happens, machines will replace humans, but they cannot replace Humanity. Humanity is everything that a machine cannot do. Empathy, communication, storytelling, trust. Holding somebody's hand, saying, I love you, saying, I'm sorry. So, really, what we need to think about is the employment at AI, not for massive efficiency gains, but to how we can elevate our people to perform better roles. Starbucks is all about coffee. On the face of it, it sells coffee. Or does it? So let me tell you a story about Starbucks. Starbucks comes from Seattle. Seattle was in the US, the city with the highest inbound migration rate in the 1990s. That basically meant more young people were moving to Seattle than any other city in the US. Now, when young people move from one city to Seattle, they leave behind friends, family, and their communities. So when they move to Seattle, the first thing they look for is community. There was none, hence Starbucks. And it's no coincidence that Howard Schultz, the CEO of Starbucks, describes Starbucks as the third place, with the other two places being the home and office. If you want coffee, you can go to McDonald's and get it half the price and in half the time. But that's the point. 
Starbucks isn't selling coffee. Starbucks sells space. You know, what Starbucks sells is community. It's the humanity that we're looking for. And if we were all about the relentless push to efficiency, go to McDonald's, go to the machine, go to the fast food retail outlet that has seats which are angled at such a degree to stop their customers falling asleep. Go to the fast food retail outlet where the customer is always right, not because in somehow that creates a better customer experience, but because that disempowers the people to make any decisions about the customer. If the customer spills something, a customer is rude, the customer is always right, which basically means your people, the employees, are always wrong. Starbucks, however, is different, even in the small touches. They ask for your name, they write your name on the cup. Could you imagine in McDonald's if they were start writing your name on the burger boxes? So why am I telling you about Starbucks? Well, Starbucks, I believe, is about selling what we as human beings look for. That's the emotional connection which is core to our existence. In the same way, when you look at healthcare, it's about care. It's about humanity. Starbucks is about community. These will never go away, despite the rise of mechanical, faceless, and often ruthless technologies that will decimate competition around it. What will never go away is humanity. And the reason I'm telling you about Starbucks is I believe podcasts are like Starbucks. See, podcasts are those conversations we don't have anymore. If you look at Joe Rogan podcast, that's like three hours long. We don't have three hour long conversations anymore. That's missing from our lives. These are the campfire conversations we've had for thousands of years. We gathered around the campfire and we connected. Those are the tribes where we felt safe and we felt belonging whether it was somebody holding us, holding our hands or sitting in a cafe. That was the belonging. That is the yearning of our human soul. And I believe Starbucks podcast recreates that. So those podcast conversations are almost like the conversations I'm sitting in. When I'm sitting here listening to a podcast, I'm there. I'm sitting with Joe Rogan and his guests just listening to that sound. And sometimes I might not actually be part of the conversation actively, but I'm part of it passively. I just hear the sounds. I feel like I belong. It's like the radio talking to me in the background. It makes me feel comfortable. And that's what we used to do in the old days. You left the radio on in the kitchen whilst you were doing your chores or whilst the family were going on about the business. Same as the car because it made us feel in those places that were lonely that we weren't alone. And when I listen to a podcast, I'm part of the conversation too. And that is what I'm buying into. I'm buying into that elevation of communication. That is great that we have all this automation. And the more we automate, the more we will yearn for this. So the more we push into AI... The more we push into the machine era, the more the human soul will cry out for the connection that it's lost. And it's no coincidence that the biggest Starbucks in the world, as of time of recording, is in Shanghai. Shanghai, China has seen possibly the biggest migration of humans in recent history. Hundreds of millions of people have moved from rural China to the cities. Many have left families. Some have even left their children to go and work in the big cities, completely disrupted and removed from their communities. Those strong units of connection are gone. So it's no coincidence that the biggest Starbucks in the world, and a work of art, I have to say, Starbucks Shanghai. This is not a McDonald's. This is a thousand seats with hardwood chairs beautiful artistic renditions and it has a huge vat made out of bronze with 
Chinese characters designed by local artists stamped on this bronze vat, this kettle. It's the art, and art really is about connection and being brave to connect and be vulnerable. And that's what we want. The more we get disconnected, the more we will seek it out. You know, everybody talks about this era of digital natives. Kids, they grew up online. Well, I've studied young people since a very early age in their development. I was studying young people and mobile phones in 1998 when I was in Japan and I saw the first young people use mobile phones and mobile tech. And I've watched these generations grow up. I've watched that generation develop the first iterations of tech speak before tech speak was a thing. I knocked on the doors of companies like Nokia in 2000, 2001 and said that the future is young people and mobile phones. And they said to me, we don't do kids because we're focusing on road warriors, middle-aged men. And I said, it ain't about that. I said, it's about teens and it's about communication and sharing. And I've seen that generation grow up and I've seen that generation go onto Facebook and take on these new technologies. And I've seen now them maturing and people still saying digital natives. And I say to them, there ain't such a thing. Young people live their lives offline and they use online to augment the offline. All meaning is created offline. If there's drama online, it's usually because of what happened at school offline. Real relationships happen offline and they use online to augment or facilitate those relationships. If you take away the offline, the online has no meaning. So my point being is that we are fundamentally analog. If you look at human history, 200,000 years of human social evolution. We have spent the last 0.01% online. Think about that. Our brains, our societies, our meanings, our everything is geared towards analog, offline connection. So as much as it looks fun to present us with robot chatbots, the human brain is geared towards real human connection. Yes, it can fake a human being, but after some time, we want authentic reality. We want the real deal. Novelty is fine, but, you know, I want a human being. And that's what everybody wants, ages 4 to 94. We are fundamentally analog beings living in a digital world. So podcasts come in to recreate that analog connection. Those conversations we don't have anymore just like those cups of coffee.